So now we're going to talk about drugs um, and make that transition from consciousness to drugs. Um, and drugs really plug into the core neurotransmitter pathways in the brain. Um, and that provides this kind of leverage point, this access point to understand what are those neurotransmitter systems doing in the normal case and how do those drugs alter those pathways and what are the kind of subjective effects on our conscious states that we experience when we alter those chemical pathways. Drugs actually are a really powerful uh, psychological research tool, so to speak. They can also be abused and, and there's all sorts of risks associated with them, but uh, there are some uh, kind of positive benefits as well. Everything's a double-edged sword as usual. So the particular neurotransmitter pathways that are really important for understanding the effects of drugs, um, we talked about in the neuroscience chapter in the textbook, it's this reticular activating system, as it's known kind of classically. And it's these midbrain areas over here, uh, down in your brainstem, very ancient evolutionary areas, uh, such as the ventral tegmental area, the uh, dorsal raphe or the various median uh, dorsal raphe nuclei, the locus cerealis, which means a blue place. <laughs> these release these neuromodulators, which are a type of neurotransmitter that have these very broad effects uh, that you're now very familiar with in the popular culture, dopamine, serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, which is also known as noradrenaline, sort of the adrenaline system, um, which is, seems to be important for engaging effort. Uh, and then these kind of basal forebrain acetylcholine cholinergic systems and the nicotine uh, substance drug uh, has an effect on these cholinergic uh, pathways and like the fact that, you know, people smoke a cigarette and get uh, able to kind of focus on some difficult mental task um, that's consistent with that uh, benefit for attention. Uh, most people think of dopamine as a kind of reward pathway, but in fact, it's really a learning pathway, as we'll see in the learning chapter. Uh, and the raphe and serotonin are very important for sleep and mood. And these have some of the most powerful effects um, uh, uh, on the brain in terms of, you know, uh, LSD, uh, magic mushrooms. These things affect the serotonin system and create these really uh, kind of massive changes in overall brain state compared to the other ones, which tend to have a more kind of, you know, uh, a modulatory effect. They're changing things a bit, but they're not just like fundamentally altering the entire character of consciousness. So serotonin is really the most powerful of these uh, brain altering, you know, conscious state altering sy systems. Okay, so just to go back over some terms that are really important as we start talking about these neurotransmitter pathways, an agonist is something that acts like a given neurotransmitter. So if we go back to our diagram of the synapse, you have these neurotransmitters that release, that are released in vesicles presynaptically, and then they bind to these receptors postsynaptically. And so that pathway of kind of releasing of neurotransmitter, binding to the postsynaptic receptors, and then also kind of the extent to which those neurotransmitters hang out there in that synaptic cleft versus kind of getting broken down and reused again for future signaling events. Um, that's this reuptake process. Um, and so uh, it's anywhere along this entire chain cascade of processes. Uh, if you facilitate the release, if you have a different substance that comes in and that binds to those receptors, um, instead of the kind of normal uh, neurotransmitter, um, uh, if you have something that prevents this uh, reuptake process and so it keeps more neurotransmitter in the synapse for a longer period of time, those are all ways in which you can be a kind of agonist. You can facilitate the overall function of that normal uh, biological pathway in the brain. And then an antagonist is something that has the opposite effect. It blocks the receptors directly. It blocks the release of the neurotransmitter. Anything that interferes with that normal chain of processing through the synapse. And so these are very general terms, agonist and antagonist, just referring to kind of amplifying or blocking uh, the normal pathway. Um, okay, and then neuromodulator, again, is this broadly released thing like dopamine, serotonin, these kinds of things, as opposed to things like glutamate, uh, which are more kind of point-to-point -point, uh, information processing. Uh, 
uh, and, and don't aren't widely uh, targets of drugs in, in particular. Okay, so now we're gonna go through particular neuromodulators and an example of how they might be affected by different drugs. So the acetylcholine pathway, ACH, um, is something that's present uh, throughout the body, uh, in your heart, in, in your muscles, but in the brain itself, it seems to be important mostly for attention, also has effects on learning and memory, um, and the nicotinic receptors uh, are particular acetylcholine receptors that are also uh, bound by nicotine in uh, tobacco smoke, for example. Um, and so that's uh, an example of, of kind of a, a drug that is an agonist for acetylcholine. It works to activate that acetylcholine pathway. Dopamine, as we say, is about uh, uh, learning. It's based on reward prediction errors, not raw reward. Cocaine, for example, uh, is the widely known substance that uh, acts like dopamine and uh, kind of hijacks the dopamine pathways. Norepinephrine uh, is important for attention engagement. Amphetamines directly activate this norepinephrine or noradrenaline pathway. Uh, and so speed, uh, in particular, other kinds of amphetamines are agonists for norepinephrine. Serotonin, which is also written as 5-HT for some reason, something with its chemical formula, as I said, is one of the most powerful substances uh, affecting mood, sleep, appetite, sex, stress, uh, all kinds of different pathways. It has a lot of different effects in the brain and depending on where it's released and where, it's, where the receptors are. And this is why, uh, for example, the widely used SSRI, the serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors um, which are known uh, popularly as like Prozac, um, that those class of drugs have very widespread side effects because of the widespread effects of serotonin itself. Um, and so the you know well-known effects of serotonin on mood are consistent with the use of Prozac for uh, um, mood disorders, depression, et cetera. Although we'll see in the treatment and disorders chapter that in fact, um, psychotherapy is actually more effective than SSRIs, just to flag that uh, in most cases with much fewer side effects because of all these different ways in, in which serotonin affects the brain. In the case of serotonin, LSD, as I mentioned, uh, really taps into, we think, the kind of wake sleep uh, modulation that serotonin performs. And you can think of the effects of serotonin as, a, I mean, of LSD as essentially in, inducing a waking dream state. That is the best description uh, that I can see. Um, oxytocin is something that has been very widely discussed recently. Uh, it's actually used uh, as uh, in its Pitocin form um, to induce labor. Uh, so it's involved in uh, regulating you know, the birth process, um, but it also has a really important role in modulating social pathways in the brain. And so people used to think it was kind of like the love drug. Uh, it makes everybody uh, um, happier, uh, warmer to their in-group members. But actually, it turns out, again, as we'll see in the social chapter, there's a, a dark side to that. It also increases the kind of hate reactions to people in the out, out group. So it upregulates both of those pathways. Then we have endorphins and substance P, and these are the uh, endogenous pathways that help regulate our pain responses. And so the use of heroin and other opiates as kind of pain treatments is widely known. Um, and, and, and so these tap into that, but they also have effects on other central neuromodulatory systems, including dopamine. Uh, and so the addictive effects of it have much more to do with those central pathway effects, including the dopamine system. Um, and so heroin, of course, is the main kind of agonist that works like these endogenous endorphins. And then GABA, uh, as we talked about in the, in the neuroscience chapter, is really everywhere. It's doing this kind of inhibition function. Um, it's not a neuromodulator in the same sense as these kind of reticular activating brainstem systems. But it is so widespread and it does have this kind of overall modulatory effect. And there are a lot of drugs actually that affect GABA. Um, and in particular, agonists increase the amount of GABA inhibition, and they produce this overall inhibition effect, depressing effect uh, on the brain activity. And so Valium and benzo benzodiazepines are agonists for GABA, increasing that inhibition. 
And that kind of just reduces brain activity, you know, eventually puts you to sleep, but in small doses kind of uh, can regulate uh, things like anxiety. Uh, and, and so alcohol also has effects on the GABA pathway. So there's a kind of orthogonal uh, set of categories that we use to identify different types of drugs. So narcotics are the, path, are the drugs that affect that endogenous endorphin uh, pathways. Um, so heroin, morphine, uh, fentanyl, et cetera. Um, then you have, uh, and these are known to be the most kind of addictive or dependency forming of, of the different types of drugs. Uh, depressants, again, are GABA agonists. Stimulants um, are a broader category uh, that include the effects on both acetylcholine, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And it turns out there's this other one known as adenosine. And adenosine is kind of the uh, antagonist to dopamine. It's the endogenous antagonist to dopamine. And so caffeine actually kind of uh, is an antagonist to the dopamine antagonist, and so therefore it's kind of a, an indirect dopamine, dopamine agonist and produces a kind of positive elevation or stimulation effect in that way. Um, and so it's, it gets pretty complicated when you start tracking through all these different ways in which these chemical systems can be modulated. And as we mentioned in the neuroscience chapter, one of the reasons that we think that we actually have you know, chemical synapses in the first place is exactly because it's easier to kind of modulate and modify the effects of these different chemical pathways to regulate the overall state of neural communication in the system as compared to a purely electrical system. And then finally, we have the uh, psychedelic system, uh, psychedelic category, which includes LSD, peyote, mescaline, psilocybin. And again, these are all affecting the serotonin pathway. And then marijuana, uh, specifically, it uh, um, affects the cannabinoid receptors, which were actually only discovered, you know, in relation to marijuana. They weren't known prior to the effect of this drug. Um, and so it's a, actually a relatively recent discovery of these cannabinoid receptors. And there's actually been several receptors that have been discovered relatively recently, including uh, this one that we show back here on this slide, uh, orexin, also known as hypocretin. Uh, which is released by the um, hypothalamus, and it it is has these kind of broader uh, regulatory effects on multiple different systems. So again, it's really really complicated. The, the layers of control and regulation that exist are, are kind of mind bending. Uh, marijuana probably also does have effects on serotonin. Has a mild kind of psychedelic effect as well. So uh, there there can be multiple effects of a given substance, especially given the complexity of uh, a substance like marijuana chemically. So this is just a diagram uh, of how benzodiazepines like Valium, et cetera, um, can have this agonist-like effect. So in the normal system, you have the GABA uh, neurotransmitter and it opens up the uh, chloride ions, allowing them to uh, uh, flow into the cell. And the benzodiazepine kind of facilitates um, the binding of these uh, GABA uh, molecules producing a kind of heightened uh, uh, effect of GABA. So there's a great website here called Mouse Party. It allows you to look at these different mice and kind of put them in the chair here. So you can grab a mouse and sit them in the chair. And then it gets in, puts them in this kind of analyzer thing and tells you exactly what's happening with this particular drug. So this is ecstasy. MDMA, one thing we didn't really talk about in the list of, of uh, slides there, and it's operating on serotonin because it affects mood states. So anyway, I really encourage you to visit this website and uh, take a look and learn about all the different uh, drug effects in this fun, interactive way. And if you do it yourself, you get to hear the groovy music taking place as well. Again, we'll talk about this when we get to the chapter on uh, disorders and treatment. But uh, a lot of people use the term addiction with respect to drugs, but the more modern term is dependence, which is a kind of more clinical level term uh, that refers to uh, the effects of withdrawal as are widely publicized in certain movies. Um, and so these, these negative effects when you, when you uh, aren't continuing to take the drug, uh, craving uh, this overall overpowering feeling of wanting it and intolerance, the need for more and more uh, drug to get the same effect. These are the kind of criteria that define dependence. Colloquially, 
this sort of is what you uh, uh, see in, in a drug addict. 